Okay, so um, hello everyone, and thank you for being here. My name is Paul D'Ambrosio, and I teach Chinese philosophy at East China Normal University in Shanghai, where the Sihai Weishu Collaborative Learning Project is based. Today, we want to welcome everyone to our second roundtable of the 2023-2024 academic year. Our topic today is environmentalism. We have a nice lineup of scholars from different places to discuss uh, environmentalism. Our speakers today include Professor Yumi Suzuki from the University of Bern. I, I'm not even gonna try your name. I've already forgotten it again. <laughs> Jean... <laughs> Jean-Yves Hurtebees. Ah, Jean-Yves Hurtebees uh, from, let me check again, sorry. Uh, Furen. From Furen Catholic Furen University. Okay. And uh, Professor Marion, uh, now I forgot this too. Hercu Herdican. Herdican, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, it's been a long day already. <laughs> uh, from Colorado College. And we also have Sarah Rubio from Princeton University serving as chair for this lecture, uh, for this round table. I want to thank everyone who's been invited and everyone in the audience for making this event possible. So the structure of the round table is as follows. Each presenter will talk for, let's say 10 to 20 minutes, uh, leaving the remainder of the time until a half an hour for discussion with the other participants. So basically each participant gets a half an hour um, and in that time they present their ideas and discuss with the other participants. Um, then once all three speakers have gone, uh, have spoken or have had their half an hour, we open the floor to questions from the audience. Um, we will end the event promptly at 11 p.m. Beijing time, which is two hours from now. So before getting started and handing things over to Sarah Rubio, I want to say just a couple words about the Sihai Weishui Collaborative Learning Academic Forum. The Sihai Weishui Collaborative Learning Project hopes to distinguish itself from some of the less productive conventional practices in contemporary academia. As posted on our website, we are not interested in male peacocks, in jerks, or in any form of egoism or other types of self-promotion. We hope to curb all forms of aggressive, look at me, I'm smarter than you, or don't I know so much, and similar types of attitudes we sometimes find in academic exchanges. The Sihai Weishui Collaborative Learning Project seeks to accomplish these shifts in orientation during academic exchange by encouraging productive communication, humble discussions, real questions, and responses that are open and honest. We hope to foster environments will, where people truly learn from and with one another. Now, before I hand things over to our chair, I'd like to briefly introduce her. Sarah Rubio is a PhD student in early Chinese intellectual history and comparative studies. Um, and ancient Greek philosophy. She has a BA in humanities from, and now I forget again, Sarah, how to say the name of this university. Un bel Fabra. Uh, in Spain, an MA from the University College Cork in Ireland, and another in East Asian studies from the University of California, Berkeley. She is currently pursuing her PhD in each East Asian studies at Princeton University, focusing on conceptions of fate and human agency in ancient China and Greece. Thank you, Sarah. I'll now let you take over the round table. Hi, um, thank you so much. You can hear me, right? Uh, thank you. So I'm going to introduce the three speakers and then we can start with the, uh, with the presentations. So the first speaker is Yumi Suzuki. Um, Yumi Suzuki is an SNSF Research Fellow at the Institute of Philosophy at the University of Bern in Switzerland, and has previously done research at the University of Durham, at the University of Hong Kong, at the East China Normal University, and at the University of Cambridge. She has been working on Greek-Chinese comparative philosophy for about 15 years, with a particular focus on methods of philosophy, logic and definitions, epistemology, and scientific reasoning. For the last four years, she has been working on the project Green Antiquity, Sino-Hellenic Envi Environmental Philosophy, and has published especially on environmental thought presented in early Taoism. Our second speaker is uh, Jean-Yves 
Hochtebis, if I'm pronouncing it like anything close to the right pronunciation. Um, he's an associate professor and director at Foreign U Catholic University, French department in Taiwan. He's also an associated research at the French Research Center on Contemporary China in Taipei. He has published extensively in the field of transcultural philosophy, environmental philosophy, and film studies, with more than 50 papers in the Journal of Chinese Philosophy, Sustainability, Spirit, and so on, um, as well as book chapters um, in Palgrave, Wiley Blackwell, Louvain, Louvain University Press, um, and so on. In 2020, he authored a monograph entitled Orientalism, Occidentalism et Universalism, and in 2021, a collective book with Constantino Meder that is in French, but I'm going to um, say the, the title in English: "Reflections of Oneself in the Mirror in the Mirror of the Other: Cross Representations of China, uh, Europe from the 20th Century to the Present Day." He is also a regular co apt contributor to the French leading newspapers and radio programs such as Le Monde, Libera Liberation, Fran Fran. France culture, um, and so on. Um, and our third speaker is Marion Hordekin, if I'm pronouncing the last name correctly. Um, he, um, she's a professor of philosophy at Colorado College, at Colorado Springs, uh, at the US and the United States. She works in environmental philosophy, ethics, and comparative philosophy, with a focus on climate ethics, intergenerational ethics, and relational approaches to ethics. Um, she is the author of Environmental Ethics from Theory to Practice and co-editor with David Havlik of Restoring Layered Landscapes. She's president of the International Society for Environmental Ethics and serves as an associate editor for the journal Environmental Ethics. Okay, so our first speaker is Yumi Suzuki. Um, she asked me to um, to send in the group chat uh, a document with a brief presentation. I, I already submitted it, so I hope everyone can see it. If not, please let me know. And I hand you the word. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for the lovely introduction, Sarah. And also, and and I really, really genuinely admire um, um, uh, the spirit and activities of this project, uh, which um, um, Paul Ambrosio established and learning uh, for already um, a few years. And so I'm really uh, grateful and honored to be given this opportunity to um, to join this project. Thank you so much. So I'm today talking about the environment thought in early Confucianism, not in Taoism. Um, so let me begin. So ancient Chinese um, developed a civilization heavily dependent on agricultural technology and product. Consequently, two of their main concerns with the environment were to control water derived from large rivers, like the Yellow and the Yangtze rivers, and the tributaries, and to manage their land to cultivate the crops and animals to provide for a rapidly increasing population. Chinese people were deeply interested in the practical question as to what the right actions are to to proper, uh, properly respond to constantly changing conditions of the natural world, non-human beings such as animals, plants, and water were therefore regarded as a mirror of the ethical political situation of their own conduct and society. So many mythic uh, legends in ancient China convey technological, economic, and cultural accomplishment of divine spirits and the sage, uh, sages of the pre-modal ages, including those of Fuxi, Nuwa, Sweden, uh, Zulon, Shenlong, uh, Fan Di, and Ho Ji. These and other divine beings drew knowledge from the natural world and taught people practical skills to employ non-human beings for their own purposes. Such skills include making fire, distinguishing edible from inedible, inspecting and plowing the so soil, sowing grains, collecting and growing fruits, nuts, and vegetables, hunting, taming, and utilizing animals, and cultivating a dietary and herbal therapies. The most significant contribution to the cultural foundation were made by three successive sage rulers, Yao Xun and Yu. 
they、uh, fail to have established an orderly, so-、uh, orderly society by driving away felonious wild animals and noxious insects, preventing natural、uh, disasters and presenting themselves as morally exemplary models. The first task Zhao initiated was to command two cranes of experts in astronomy to create a lunar solar calendar for people to organize the seasonal labor、uh, throughout the year in forestry, husbandry, stock breeding, hunting and fishing, and for animals to grow and reproduce healthy. Water management was vital、um, for the survival of the state. While rivers carry clean water for daily life and fertile soil for farming nourish,、uh, nurture, nature, sorry, rich aquatic,、uh, aquatic products and other animals and plants, and function as an important means of transformation,、uh, they also often threaten the people's lives. Guanzon, a state、um, and, and philosopher, identifies the five most serious disasters for the state as those caused by water, drought, atmospheric、uh, conditions, and pestilence and the insect. The disasters caused by water, he advocates, require the greatest care from the government. So, water management of you. During the reign of Shun is consequently one of the most popular legends in classical literature. During the reign of Yao, constant floods inundated his territories. Yao appointed Gun、uh, for flood control but gained no result, which eventually rather increased the number of the dead. After ascending the throne,、uh, Shun promoted Gun's son, Yu. Who tirelessly devoted himself to the project for nine years and finally succeeded in quelling the fraud. You employed various sophisticated hydraulic engineering for already existing and newly built dike stamps and kernels and drainage systems. Truly remarkable, however, was Yu's deep understanding of the nature, Shin, and the Tao of water. He took advantage of water as spontaneous movement and allowed it to flow naturally in the right direction, in contrast with Gun, who tried to contain water with high leaves by forcing it into、uh, unnatural passes. The fundamental lesson behind the course historical tale of Yu. Is that there is a point of compromise between human necessity and the well being of nature. Technological and economic progress does not necessarily harm the, and, or conflict with other living and non living beings. There is a path allowing both sides to flourish. The evolution of civilization is inevitable. So it is fundamental,、uh, fundamental part of the transformative process, i.e., the Tao of the world. Though the skills and technology invented by humans are also inevitable products that result from the working of nature, i.e., the constant interaction of human and other beings. Hence, the main role of the ruler is to achieve harmony between government and the environment by adequately fulfilling the third element of the triad between heaven and earth, and to complete a happy unification. Uh, Shunzu maintains that there are two realms, one、uh, responsible for heaven, another responsible for human, and attempt to interfere or exercise influence, or inf-、um, exercise influence on the former is useless because its power and working cannot be overcome by human. Instead, humans should be, ho-、um, should be focusing on the scope of their own duty, namely to establish a society in which each person, including the ruler, Federal laws, governmental officials, and field workers all play their respective roles to respond to the transformation of nature at the proper time and its proper way in order to ensure benefit for their own community. However, whether this ideal philosophical blueprint is practical is a different question. According to research conducted by environmental historians, Uh, climat- climatologists and archaeologists, it is evident that the ex- extensive、uh, environmental destruction, including deforestation、uh, deforest- deforest- um, and、uh, desertification and soil erosion induced by human activities, have accelerated since the second millennium BCE. Some scholars even point out that the frequent flooding. May have been caused by widespread artificial modification of landscape.
Wild animals, not only tigers, leopard, uh, rhinoceroses, and elephant, but also rabbit, deer, uh, wolves, and foxes, were deprived of their habitat by the development of ag agriculture. These animals were also hunted for meat, uh, coat, uh, hides, horn, ivory, uh, sacrificial offer offering, etc. Increasing warfare amongst the newly emerging state widely damaging, uh, damaged both living and non-living beings. The development of metallurgy uh, uh, accelerated large-scale deforestation too. So Zwanzer's argument on the utility of trees, uh, geese, and horses are not just a metaphor for people striving to be useful to the state in order to climb the uh, social political hierarchy, but who um, em um, embroiled uh, in political strife and eventually executed. This analogy also reflects how uh, specific animals and plants, which were especially useful for humans, were in reality proliferated uh, to be eventually killed and exploited. Such species include, for example, hazels, uh, catalpuses, uh, catalpas, uh, chestnuts, uh, lacquer, uh, willows, uh, polu uh, polonias, uh, mulberries, Chinese dates, and many domesticated and game animals. The Chinese view of the environment does not merely depend on biological and ecological, but the all uh, biology and ecology, but also is uh, closely connected with or sometimes shaped by ethics, polit uh, political philosophy, economics, and rhetoric. No human beings were a resource for state, uh, state prosperity as much as humans were, as people often uh, compared with uh, straightened, um, straightened timbers. Efficiently um, handling and ordering the wilderness of both humans and non-human beings was the core mission of the government. Among the few uh, dec uh, detractors uh, of this ideology were Taoist thinkers some of whom explicitly endorsed a primitivist utopia by criticizing the cultural achievement of the mystical sages. They instead urge individual living beings to nourish their own bodily and mental well-beings while also cherishing other forms of life. Nonetheless, there was no consensus amongst early Chinese thinkers on what is considered natural or inevitable, i.e. Zuren, uh, for each living being, Han Yin, one of the scholars and the emperor uh, Wen of Han, even stated that the nature of a cocoon is to produce a silk, but that it will not be completed without female workers who boil these cocoons in hot water and extract their governed patterns. The so-called harmony, which is supposed to be accomplished between civilization and nature, remained a controversy. However, there are a lot of governmental positions concerned with natural resources. Should, for example, uh, list five relevant officials amongst others, the master of cups arranges sacrificial animals, uh, the director of public works is in charge of maintaining irrigation facilities, repairing dikes and bridges, opening uh, gutters and ditches, securing water uh, reservo uh, reservoirs, and dams and uh, releasing them at the proper times. The overseer of a field uh, manages agricultural project, examining of the land, uh, inspection of soil quality, and arranging uh, arrangement of various seed. The master of provision um, is issues a regulation for nurturing the mountain, forest, and mushroom tree, uh, uh, grasses, fish, turtles, etc. The village master is in charge of cultivating domestic animals and training people in horticulture. The Book of Light also mentioned uh, a superintendent of land, wood, water, and grasses. The, uh, the six manufacturers um, again under the care of superintendent, uh, in superintendent of the worker in earth, metal, stone, wood, and the skin of animals and twigs. Similar divisions of labor are thought to have already existed during the Zhou dynasty. Various prohibited activities, especially during the breeding and the growing seasons, are found in Almanac uh, for the 12 months in the Liu Shi Chun Tzu and elsewhere with some discrepancies. For example, in the first months of spring, no female animals should be used as sacrificial victims. It is prohibited to cut down trees, overturn nests, or kill your very young creatures, creatures still in the womb, 
and the frizzling uh, bird uh, fronts and eggs. Uh, in the second month of spring, water in streams, marshes, and the ponds are maintained to prevent drying up. Sacrificial animals are substituted by jade insignia or skins and the silks. In the third month of spring, no one is allowed to use barbs and hand nets for hunting, rabbit snare and net, uh, gauzy uh, netting for bird or poisoned food for animals. Also, foresters are not allowed to fell the mulberry in the first month of summer. Any construction involving earth is suspended to protect the growth of plant. In the second month of summer, uh, prohibitions include harvesting uh, indigo plants, burning wood for charcoal, and bleaching cloth in the sun. In the middle months of winter, projects involving the soil are again not undertaken to keep us the chi contained and not to disturb uh, hibernating insects and other living beings. Several, uh, several times in the year, uh, official uh, offering are made to spring of mountains, forest, steve, spring, and marshes. Even when hunting is allowed, the number of prey are strictly determined. So an seasonal audience, uh, ordinance or by a ruler were believed to cause environmental disorder and calamities, including flood and drought and seasonal um, uh, uh, for uh, several, uh, sorry, severe wind, rains, and cold and hot temperature, early or late withering of grasses and trees, or a prolification of weeds such as uh, briars, uh, darnels, brambles, and uh, temisia, or vermin, heavy forest, uh, snow, uh, frost, uh, snow, moisture, cloud, fog, um, or dew that ruin crops, the um, loss of mountain and hill harvest. A uh, premature crop growth, a uh, failure in animal, plants, and human reproduction, a uh, disorderly attack of play, animals, and frequent disease, plague, uh, pestilence, uh, leprosy, and whole uh, ulcers. The main point I'm making here today uh, is that despite the popular tendency or attempt to extol Chinese philosophy as an alternative to Western philosophy for solving contemporary environmental problems, as one of the most successful technologically oriented civilizations, the environmental destruction or transformation undertaken in early China was very likely both crucial and extensive. Yet it was also Somewhat ironically, for this reason, that ancient China developed this very sophisticated agricultural economy and the effective environmental policies to protect its natural resources. So thank you very much. This is uh, my presentation. Hi. Um, okay, great. Um, so now we have some time for um, discussion with the other presenters, with the other participants. If there are any questions or comments. I'll go ahead and start if um, no one else is waiting. Um, yeah, I just wanted um, to invite you to maybe say a little bit more to expand on the conclusion you develop at the end. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion of uh, to what extent we can draw on um, lessons, insights, concepts, frameworks uh, from ancient China to think about uh, human relations with the broader world and with one another in contemporary times. Um, and you obviously gave us a sort of capsule conclusion um, summarizing your perspective, but I think there's more to be drawn out. And I just wanted to invite you to say a little bit more. Uh, thank you so much for asking this. So um, a lot of, um, so what I'm working on Confucius environmental thought, and um, uh, the previously um, uh, for the, the theme environmentalism, a lot of um, um, Taoist thinkers were 
uh, examined. And um, um, it is true that Taoist think uh, is probably environmental friendly and um, um, uh, probably also that it is easy to introduce uh, for individual people uh, to, to think about uh, their own relation with the environment. And um, and I think uh, um, I think actually Paul Ambrosio published a very good article about this, and I learned uh, uh, from it uh, uh, very uh, very much. And um, um, on the other hand, uh, what do we can what I I was thinking what do we can learn from uh, um, Confucianism? And the good thing of Confucianism is uh, it's uh, really kind of related to the environmental issue which we are facing today, not in the sense that the relation between humans and non-human beings in on the earth, but uh, it's more like human versus human. And uh, when environmental, basically, basically natural resources are limited, and we are kind of competing uh, to 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 make use of them or to obtain them as much as possible, winning other people. <laughs> and if there is a problem <laughs> in the environment, why not other people can solve it? <laughs> and this kind of attitude, which is not really um, uh, us as, as individual people who is doing recycle thing and you know raising trees and appreciating the nature it's, it's all right everything it's it's wonderful but on the other hand international um conflict um, especially relevant to economic competition is really really um kind of diminishing a lot of attempt in environmental um uh, em environmentalism and when we think about how we can really solve this uh, human versus human problem, not the human versus nature problem, um, I think Confucianism is uh, um, more seriously thought about it because they are more, more con concerned with um, political strategies rather than Taoism, not talking about politics much. And um, um, no, they are talking, but uh, quite a limited uh, extent. And um, uh, when we think about it, they thought about uh, how we should really kind of control or restrict human desire, want more, but work less. <laughs> and uh, and how they can they can uh, the government can manage that kind of people's um, uh, limitless um, um, appetite. And uh, and uh, also kind of like a competition between states and so on. Um, in that, um, I think they really seriously thought about it and um, um, try to resolve it. Um, previously, one postgraduate PhD student asked me, "So, do you think that they they also thought about the sustainability of the environment?" And it's a little bit too much to go. <laughs> I think it's sustainability is more kind of like a uh, more modern idea, but um, I think they definitely thought that uh, how we can we can make use of the limited natural resources which we have uh, for for all the people in the state, and that is I think uh, um, what we can learn uh, from uh, Confucianism rather than Taoism. That is what I think. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So, so uh, uh, thank you, Professor uh, Suzuki, for for your for your talk. Uh, it was uh, uh, very interesting. I, I had also the time to to read the, the paper that you sent to us, and about uh, Eric Nelson book. And uh, I also wrote a book review about uh, Eric Nelson book on Taoism and uh, environment. So I also wrote a book review about that and also contributed to the same uh, volume of Asian studies than uh, of Paul D'Ambrosio. And so I, I, I really, uh, I think some of the things that I would say in my talk, I think will echo uh, the things that you said. Um, I, I don't actually have, have so uh, so many questions, just, just some comments that, I really like the talk, and uh, 
what I found an idea that it gave to me that um, you know the idea of um, taking care of nature. I mean, you, you, I think you make this point is that if you are speaking about uh, taking care about nature, it is because you are reacting to some process which is going on of the opposite. Okay, so it is uh, by reaction to an opposite uh, process of transformation, destructive from transformation. For I mean, for social human purpose that can be legitimate by I mean by any standard. Okay, but you you are I think you are totally right. I mean to to point out that the you know the core element of civilization, you know, in Chinese speaking, how much civilization is important. I mean, when being and in different aspects of of this thing, I mean, is necessarily in some way conflating conflating with you know. With, with some of the what we call today, I mean, this kind of purely naturalistic or ecological conservationist aspiration, because civilization means transformation. You're transforming the, the, the nature to, to make, you know, to make the, 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 the emergence of, of human society possible. I mean, in terms of in terms of agriculture, in terms of, of the society, in terms of relation between people, etc. So, uh, uh, yeah, I think. Uh, I mean, I agree. <laughs> okay, so I don't have so many questions. I mean, I would have a question because, you know, more precise, I mean, I mean, if I really need to read it again, you know, to, to, to you know, to, to point, pinpoint to, to this reference that you make and this reference that you make. And for example, in the beginning, you, you are cutting all these legendary figures. Maybe, maybe, okay, my, my, my kind of question, or these legendary figures that you caught in the beginning, to some extent, I mean, if I may, to some extent, when you caught them or when you mention them, it's almost as we forget that they are legendary. <laughs> you, you see what I mean? When you are mentioning them, it's it looks like they're part of history. So 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 uh, 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 so if they are legendary figures, it is because they have been you know invention creation. Uh, I mean, later in the past, in order to, you know, retrospectively, as Bergson would say, you know, in retrospect, you know, like of legitimize or rationalize a process of transformation. But cutting them in the beginning is, I mean, I understand you say they are legendary figures, but at the same time, it's almost like it is taking kind of historical reality, you know, like, a, oh, okay, this is the inception of, 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 this, of this thing. So, yeah, I was, you know, maybe, I don't know, Maybe a kind of contextualization of the historicity of the of the production of legendary figures will avoid us to to err uh, will avoid us to, to 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 think that you know we are thinking about something that is uh, you know the kind of historical beginning of ecological thinking something like that yeah mm -hmm. so I I would have more historical background of these things otherwise we may. You know, believe that oh yeah, that's great. You know, all, all this what they did in the beginning of, of the history of humanity that's so advanced, etc. Yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. It's a, it's a. How to say it's a, you gave me really broad a uh, picture <laughs> of how I should locate my research <laughs> in the in the in this um in this really interesting um 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 history of. Uh, really like um intellectual history um and uh, so yes so so what do we i think as you said what do we 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 tend to forget is that the, uh from the beginning of um uh um really the civilization any civilization not only china actually um uh for example like egypt has nile and uh, they they had a, a uh, much problem to uh, to kind of uh, try um, how to how to treat the flood of Niles, and um, so any civilization actually have uh, this kind of I think problem. And the, as you said, that uh, as a kind of like a beginning uh, of um, or or kind of a beginning of noticing or realizing there is a conflict between humans. And non-human beings, and uh, it's 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 
it's interesting to see that the, probably this recognition didn't happen when you are just fighting for survival. But uh, because of the huge population and the luxury things uh, started to um, um, widespread uh, to not to just the ruler, but the middle um, middle class. I, maybe I, I shouldn't say middle class, but the, like upper class people and so on and so on. So they started to recognize, well, here is a, a, a kind of um, conflict um, between um, them, which they have to solve. And this recognition um, um, is probably, as you can say, the beginning of a sort of environmental philosophy. Um, when since I'm working on ancient Greek and Chinese comparative philosophy, um, quite a long time, um, later I thought like fifteen years a little bit <laughs> to exaggeration, but uh, but uh, quite a long time. And uh, the the difference between Greek and the Chinese were Greeks didn't have that kind of view of environment. Partly because they are not really agriculturally oriented civilization, in the sense that they uh, got what they uh, they need from other countries, so the trading was uh, more important. So when we think about live uh, live uh, water, for example, uh, water in Greeks Greeks are oceans, not rivers. Um, so they are always thinking about like traveling around and uh, um, for for example, natural disaster was also different because uh, uh, they are more uh, had more uh, volcanic eruption and so on. So the relation between nature is quite different. So it's it's a, a little bit like anthropological ideas. Um, um, uh, I, I'm thinking. Um, I'm not necessarily saying that we have to think about it, but I, I'm I'm concerned with uh, uh, that kind of historical background and anthropological um, um, information. Uh, how these um, different uh, environments start to uh, prop up in dif in different regions. And so, yes, uh, thank you so much. That wonderful, um, uh, really like a bad view uh, you gave me. And uh, thank you. I think I will more carefully think. And in the future. Okay, um, thank you. Um, we can move on to. Ah, if someone has a question, um, we will have time at the end after the three presentations for everyone to. So, um, Jen, if. Okay. So, is she my PPT? Uh, so, can you, yeah, can you see it, please, Ping? Yes. Yeah, that's okay. So, now it is bigger, I think. Uh, so, hi, everyone. So, uh, yeah, sorry. So, my, sorry, I'm just... Uh, yeah. So, uh, hi everyone. My name is uh, Jean Vertebi. So I will. Uh, I'm um, associate professor at uh, Fulham Catholic University and uh, also director of the French department, and um, also associate researcher of the CFC Taipei. Uh, so my talk uh, is entitled "Chinese Ecological Civilization: Greenwashing with Occidentalist Characteristics." So sorry for the uh, provocative title. Uh, so I will speak about mainly about this concept of Shenzhou Weiming, and um, I will talk about it in kind of more analytical and deconstruct deconstructionist way, you know, like a kind of you know deconstruction the deconstructionist uh, approach to this uh, concept. So uh, in uh, 2007, uh, we know that China becomes the, the world largest CO2 emitter, and uh, in the Sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, and the first um, uh, CO2 emitter, and since 2013, uh, China per CO2 emission has been higher than the European Union uh, per capita CO2 emission. 
And uh, today, I mean, last year, the P PRC CO2 emissions are 29% uh, of the totals, almost three times the CO2 emission of the US. Um, so uh, interestingly, uh, what is, I think, interesting Okay. So hopefully he will come back. I think, Paul, are you talking? Sorry, my headphones don't work. I was also saying, uh, yeah, Yumi, it was a really nice presentation too, right? Because um, a lot of times, I mean, I'm just sort of repeating what you said, right? But Confucian resources have a lot of uh, different insights into how to think about these issues. And normally we only relate this to um, Taoism, but like you said, right, there's um, there's a there's a good number of things in Confucianism and also the sort of more political side um, is very important, right, especially today. Um, and at least my I, myself, I think that if you don't have sort of action from the top, that there's not much we can do, right? So um, I think it's really great that you have been focusing on this. And we can see if... Thank you for that. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sorry, it seems that I was sorry, it seems that I was cut from the, the internet. So I'm uh go back uh, on the okay, I'm go going going back with you. So okay, can you see my PowerPoint? So sorry for the interruption. Yeah, that's okay. Hi everyone, yeah. Yeah, we see you it. Know. Okay, ha. Ha why so okay. So uh, I was saying that, I don't know where, where I stop. So I say that uh, the year China becomes the first uh, world largest CO2 emitter. Uh, it also started to promote at the political official level the notion of Shanghai Wenming. And, um, and then it was institutionalized deeper and deeper uh, at different political level. So um, in 2006, uh, Panue, I was one of the first to coin the concept, again, at the semi-official political level. And uh, when he, he coined the concept, he starts with the idea that actually uh, there was a necessity to speak about uh, environment, uh, rethink about environmentality in China, because as he, as he said, in 20 years, China has achieved economic results. That took a century to attain the West, but we have also uh, concentrated a, a century's worth of environmental issue into these uh, 20 years. So there was a kind of recognition, official, official recognition of the environmental issues, uh, I mean, produce uh, environmental harms produced by the uh, Chinese mode of a very quick, extensive, uh, extractive uh, development. And so, um, was he was also uh, stressing the fact that China had become the larger also uh, oil uh, um, coal uh, consumer, which is which is uh, as you can say see the case because today in the world there are two kind of coal consumer China and the rest of the world. Okay, so uh, the Chinese ecological civilization um, it was based um, on the narrative that uh, and this is why it's interesting me. And the narrative that environmental threats actually were coming from the West 
and that to reduce the exposure, the exposure of Chinese society to environmental risk, it will be necessary to curb Western cultural influence and instead favor uh, uh, promote Chinese cultural tradition. So this is what he said, we live with Chinese culture, but our modernization drive is based on Western logic. However, it's not a wise choice to copy the Western model of industrial modernization, especially in China, because that model will result. And what is interesting is a will. I mean, it's kind of future, but actually it has already happened. Uh, will result in serious conflict with the environment and resources in such a developing country as China. It is necessary, so another paper, but the consequence, it is necessary to turn to the traditional uh, Chinese culture for a correct guideline in our modernization and our cultural structure and to make the ecological wisdom in the Chinese civilization an important component of the ecological civilization. So this is uh, this idea that I will speak about. I mean, uh, the idea is that uh, environmental arms were the produce, were the produce, were the construct, uh, were the result of uh, something coming from Western culture, and uh, that in order to you know to to avoid this kind of negative environmental consequence, we just have you know to to totally shift uh, from uh, the Western influence to a Chinese cultural tradition, and all this uh, harmful environmental consequence of development, we just I mean disappear. Okay, so then several uh, definition of the concept have emerged. Ecological civilization is a new stage in the development of human civilization. And a new model for for that that you can after industrial civilization, meaning I mean Chinese ecological civilization coming after Western industrial civilization. Uh, ecological civilization is a cultural ethical model that implies harmonious symbiosis between human and nature. And then it was uh, it was not only I, I would say political uh, a cage phrase, but it was. Uh, start to be uh, to be you know rooted in some of kind of conceptual apparatus, uh, especially by uh, to Weiming, and uh, when he was speaking about this kind of new Confucian ecological turn, so he says that the new Confucian ecological turn has great significance significance for China's spiritual of the definition, for it urges the nation to rediscover its own. Uh, it has also profound implication for the sustainable future of the global community, meaning that that it can be a model for the, for the sustainable future of the community, provided the global community adopt uh, this model of uh, uh, ecological civilization. And then what is interesting is that in this, uh, in this development of this notion of ecological civilization, there was always this idea to go back you know, to the, to, to the uh, traditional uh, philosophical concept, and uh, even at the, so here you have kind of interesting connection between the, I would say the press, uh, the media, uh, official media level, and going back to the, you know, very core uh, uh, Chinese uh, philosophical concept. And so, for example, the people daily emerge, Panier concept with two aiming uh, uh, notion, and going back to, 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 uh, to Darjia and to uh, Zhuangzi. And saying that in the in Zhuangzi, you have the notion of uh, men and nature are one, and it is one of the most essential components of Chinese tradition and Chinese China's most important contributions to humanity. Okay, and all, actually, this idea it has also attracted a lot of foreign scholars, and uh, we need to understand why. I'm not sure I will have time to, to go into the why. So, for example, Slovic, a very famous eco critic, eco -critic um, he said that uh, this uh, ecological civilization is a, a realization of traditional uh, Chinese values. So, yeah, there is uh, many uh, interesting aspects in this uh, Chinese ecological civilization. And uh, I just really uh, acknowledge that it may be helping Chinese environmental policies to be accepted uh, by the population by giving a kind of you know, cultural uh, roots and also help also to impose some of the most difficult uh, to accept environmental regulation at the regional and local administrative levels. But here my point will be uh, more to, to, to address, I would say the culturalist aspect of it. Okay, first, what we can say is that since uh, 2007 and the inception of the conception of, uh, of the conception um, of ecological civilization, Change at the macroscopic level are not so obvious to say to say the least. So uh, I mean that I mean to say it very simple: economic growth and China as I mean economic growth has been I mean tremendous as we all know. 
uh, in the past uh, 20, uh, 30 years, economic growth, I mean, whether capitalist or socialist, Christian or Confucian, is equally generating CO2 and ecociding the planet. So, and, and actually, as you can, as you know, there is a strict correlation between GDP uh, and, for example, coal, coal consumption and, and, thus, um, and energy consumption in general. Okay. So, uh, second, historically speaking, as it was said by the previous speakers, the idea that Chinese civilization would be and has always been ecological does not really co correspond to whole historical records. Uh, so, um, here I'm, I'm quoting different uh, scholars. According to historical records, visitation, destruction occur nationwide and frequently in Christian China. And another paper also in 2016 uh, by uh, Miao and Tong, and recently uh, 2022 uh, paper on the dynamic interaction between deforestation and rice cultivation during the Holocene in the Lower Yangtze River. Uh, here's the, the picture from this paper, also demonstrate uh, these things that actually um, civilizational um, progression of the empire goes with an extensive. Uh, progression of uh, agricultural cultivation. Okay, and historically speaking, as we know, uh, it's not only that we have rice cultivation, uh, deforestation causing uh, rice cultivation was causing uh, deforestation, and it was a concern, as reminded by Elville. But also during the Maoist period, I mean, the the the, 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 the main idea was the conquest of nature by men. So, so here is something interesting that you know, thirty just thirty years after, we say, oh, we, I mean, in the Chinese civilization, you never had the idea that uh, that the men should conquest nature. I mean, so just uh, twenty years ago, it was the main uh, idea of the development of 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 the uh, Chinese nation. And so, also, we have also to remind that until very really recently, and and maybe also still today, sometimes. You know, the, the, the idea is that, you know, this kind of environmental concerns, environmental regulations are just a way uh, used by Western powers to contain uh, Asian development uh, and Chinese development in particular. Okay, so third, uh, in terms of concept, uh, we also should remind that our, our understanding of nature as environment is kind of new. I mean, nature can mean a lot of different things. So, for example, you have the Greek Roman notion of phusis, uh, uh, natura, and which is linked to a notion of growth process. And then you have also the notion of nature, which comes to be linked to the notion of cosmos and to the totality of the universe. So here you have already two different things, a dynamic a notion of nature and a notion of nature that is defining the whole, the totality of, of, of the beings. And then in the modern scientific period, nature starts to mean some things related to my, matter, movements, the movement of atoms, the law of movements. And then during the Romantic period, after the Industrial Revolution, by reaction to it, nature starts to have this kind of, you know, environmental meaning that maybe we have today. I mean, that was nature start to be, to mean something that was outside the cities of men. That was, you know, place of deprivation, uh, place of, 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 you know, a lot of vices and a lot of problems. And we, we need to go back to, 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 to nature. And then the, the discipline of ecology was actually, you know, developed very lately uh, in terms of natural conservation. Okay, so uh, this is why also uh, Vedder, he pointed out that the natural environment uh, enters the Chinese vocabulary in the modern forms recently. And of course, that doesn't mean that we can find in classical Chinese texts, in classical Taoism or Song Neo-Confucianism elements which can contribute to enriching our understanding of human relations with nature. And many passages of, from Zhuangzi can be um, interpreted as such, even if they are referring to kind of, of you know, idealistic or we say ideal utopian uh, uh, moment of, of the of the connection, pure harmony between man and nature. And uh, also, um, I will say that giving to Zhuangzi the ideal description of human life and purely ecological dimension may be anachronistic. Uh, because, uh, for example, when we speak about, you know, uh, as it was said by the uh, People Daily, that Zhuangzi said, uh, uh, which is actually not uh, in the Zhuangzi, but okay, this is an, another question. So here's the question is, when we are, here we are doing something strange that we are using this notion of Qian 
has meaning today in nature. But we know, I mean, that Tien is, is, has a lot of possible meaning. I mean, heaven, sky, nature, cosmos, and environment. So what I would like to say is that when we use this kind of notion of the harmony between Tien and, and, and human being, and unity between the two things, uh, here you have kind of, of possible retrospective uh, interpretation of that. And, you know, I mean, for a long, I mean, post, post colonial, uh, postmodern scholars have criticized a lot the fact that the missionaries, uh, they, they understand Tien as God and say, oh, it's very it's modern Eurocentric Orientalism. But I will say that maybe interpreting Tien as environment is maybe kind of, uh, kind of contemporary Sinocentric self Orientalism. Uh, and it is linked to the Chinese cultural civilization concept. So, Another thing is um, to, to understand this notion of, of the Chinese-ness of ecological civilization as something related to Occidentalism. And uh, Occidentalism, this concept was developed by uh, Buruma and Margaret, meaning that the West is deprived of soul, of consciousness. It is alienated by monetary greed and the core logic of mechanical materialism and uh, disincarnated rationalism. So this is, uh, we say, the negative portrait of the West uh, by uh, the non-West. And so uh, from this perspective, European enlightenment was actually an era of darkness, not an, an era of, of, of light, and your freedom, scientific rationalism, and peaceful cosmo cosmopolitanism are just, you know, seen by Occidentalist writers as something corrupting the cultural moral integrity of traditional non-Western social uh, societies or bodies, and uh, which are, by, are nurtured by opposite values of collective obedience, emotional historicism, and heroic nationalism. So this is uh, things that he says in this book. And, and what is very interesting for me is that Occidentalism, it first emerged in the West. So it is something that actually emerged uh, in the uh, German Romantic writers. And actually, there are a lot of common features between uh, Germany in the beginning of, of the 19th century and China in the beginning of the 20th century. So both early uh, Germany 19th century and China early 20th century, they believe in, in this kind of cultural uniqueness and uh, about the need to uh, strengthen your own culture to avoid the, 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 the corruption of, of the materialist corruption of the forest, foreign, the foreign being for the Germans, the French Enlightenment, and for the Chinese, I mean, the, 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 the European or, uh, um, I would say, barbarian invaders. So here, what is also interesting is that in this context, that the notion of, of, you know, decline of the West and rise of the East, which is so popular, uh, was also, I, I think, one of the first to claim that was Yang Qichao. And uh, he claimed that in his uh, very specific uh, um, part of his history, of uh, in his uh, rationalist understanding of history as a, a struggle between uh, races. Okay, so in this way, we say that Chinese ecological civilization looks like the green variation of Liang Chuming Easternization. So Easternization in the North, an historic messianic movement to save the West from rural deficiencies and cross materialism, providing an antidote to the perceived ills of Western society. So actually, the notion of, of uh, uh, ecological, Chinese ecological civilization is much more in link with this, with this uh, notion, Yang Chuming, notion of Easternization. And um, so, so, so in, in this regard, uh, this notion of Chinese ecological civilization it should be understood in relation with other you know, broader culturalist assumption about the difference between so-called Asian ethos and uh, European uh, ethos a notion of ecological spirituality. And uh, I think that this empire uh, on culture is attractive, you know, for scholars on uh, for scholars of cultural studies, because we think that culture is, is so important because we are it's our area of research. And but I think it is kind of self-deceptive. And uh fifth, epistemologically speaking, the idea that the ideology of the superstructure called culture can transform the economy of the infrastructure called development seems rather anti-Marxist. And thus, uh, it's, it's the interesting part of the, uh, of the narratives of the Chinese ecological civilization, which seems to me not fitting so well with the uh, uh, Marxist uh, idea. And uh, of course, it is linked to the, uh, the fact that Marxism has been synthesized 
And there is also in this kind of idea, in this kind of idea to turn to traditional Chinese culture for a correct guideline for in our modernization, there is kind of also of a greening of the old saying of you know China, Chinese knowledge for principle and Western knowledge for practice, which is for Buram and Magali uh, is kind of, of, of difficult because you cannot separate one kind of knowledge from another. Okay, then I almost finished epistemologically speaking. Uh, I mean, you cannot create fire power plants and cars based on the analex or the eating. And uh, so for that, you, you need some you know, modern science. I, I didn't say Western science because modern science is transcultural. So, um, and and uh, I will say that the science of industrialization, as well as its harmful effects on the environment, no, no borders and do not belong to any national culture. So engineers and scientists today from all over the world contribute to its development and its extension. So uh, Chinese uh, concluding Chinese ecological civilization should be understood in the broader, this concept, in the broader context of the culturization, what I, we call the culturization, the culturalization of the Anthropocene as something Western. And this is what I would call broad, brown occidentalism which is a negative complement of the positive green orientalism. Meaning that the West, because of its very uh, cultural culture is responsible for all our ecological harms. And uh, so and it's only by escaping the Western culture and mindset that we will save us and the planet. So uh, it has been uh, ad advocated at different level and um, it has received different forms. One of the problem for me with that uh, is that this uh, uh, I mean, demonization of, of Western culture as a region of all past environmental uh, 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 ills? Uh, for me, uh, this kind of, of culturalization of the Anthropocene, it prevents us also from understanding when and why the Anthropocene began and what is uh, what are its sociological foundation. In particular, you know, the, the, the issue of the divide between rich and poor in different countries and the fact that actually, uh, as we know, I mean, uh, the, 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 the richest uh, 500 million people are actually responsible for 50% of the carbon dioxide emission and the poorest uh, 3 billion people only for 6%. So, so uh, here, the, the issue of culture may be a way to rationalize, to rationalize away the social dimension of it. Okay, and so in this regard, the social as uh, a notion of self orientalization, I think, uh, is can be uh, more appropriate even the notion of occidentalism to uh, characterize the problems that we have here. Uh, and according to uh, Arif Dierlik, uh, self orientalism is a naive and tragic attempt to protect oneself from the cultural hybridization coming with globalization. It is naive because you cannot protect your culture from globalization when your economy is an integral part of it, and tragic because in the context of resisting uh, foreign hegemony, it contributes, it contributes to uh, homogenizing internal cultural diversity and solidifying uh, domestic social control. And in this sense, uh, to some extent, I'm wondering if the notion of Chinese cultural civilization cannot be understood in the framework of look, uh, uh, notion of green governmentality, and um and to uh, which is you know continuation of, of notion so Luke he develops the notion of geopower to an extension of notion of Foucault notion of geo of biopower and that means that uh, human life and social work are becoming less important than land resources and energy production so we all we know in those to remember that the notion of ecological civilization in English was coined by Morrison in a in a book uh, with the same title, saying that ecological civilization is built on three independent pillars: democracy, balance, and harmony. And the notion of Shang Tai Weiming, uh, if he's stressing balance and harmony, uh, the notion of democracy does not seem to include uh, the direct engagement of civil society. And so uh, there is there is a kind of eco panopticon. Uh, with Chinese characteristic uh, in terms of this, uh, if I if I use uh, look uh, concept, okay. So if it is true, as Rachel argued, that the promotion of Chinese is based on the claim of one's own natural land, natural land, naturalness, then the concept of ecological civilization is a logical expression of the green orientalist and brown occidentalist narrative. 
So since uh, Chinese-ness uh, for ratio is uh, at, is linked to the notion of you know um, non-mimetic, literal-minded, and therefore pr virtuous, primitive, and noble savage. So in this regard, the ideology of Chinese political civilization is today actually displays what is interesting by the narrative about traditional Abor Aboriginal wisdom. So today, many, many uh, scholars will say, no, it's, we don't need, we don't, don't need so much, you know, uh, Asian wisdom. What we need is to go back to uh, Aboriginal wisdom. And uh, there is uh, a lot of anthropologists that are using this framework uh, to, to cri criticize uh, today uh, environmental issues. Okay, meaning that actually, um, meaning that actually, uh, uh, it's, it's not in terms of we not in terms of different civilization. It's just um, the the issue is with civilization itself. So according to the uh, philosopher Johnny Clancy, the, the Anthropocene is uh, another illustration of human internal death drive and self destructive impulse. Anthropocene Anthropocene is humanity suiciding itself via the degradation. Of these living conditions. But for some scholars like Danowski and Vivo Descatro, it's not actually suicide, it is murder. So it's the murder of one part of the population by another. Okay, so here, just concluding here, really concluding. So, what's interesting me is this narrative as such. I mean, so in the 18th century, to replace the church, intellectuals. They indulge, in, they indulge in the narrative of progress and science to improve humanity and save us from irrational superstition. In the 19th century, uh, because the narrative of progress and, and science was faced with some issues. So, you know, what was promoted was art and beauty as a new idol, saving humanity. And then in the beginning of the century, it was, you know, it was not uh, this uh, idealist narrative about art, it was replaced by promotion of. of social salvation, material salvation. And now it seems that intellectuals going turning back again to this kind of idealist uh, promotion of either Chinese culture or Aboriginal wisdom to uproot uh, Western technological artificiality by non-Western cultural natu naturality. But what is interesting me is that uh, this narrative of salvation by otherness, I think, um, what is left over by all this narrative, okay, be it uh, Chinese ecological civilization or, or any other one, is that maybe there is in human being a metaphysical sense of longing and dissatisfaction. And uh, to, saving the, to the saving of the earth by turning to Aboriginal way of living or, or Chinese ecological civilization, I think it misses a metaphysical point that human capacity to go against oneself. So here we say something very, very kind of strange. And we say that the fact that human flourishing goes with earth destruction testifies, even in a very negative form, a positive reality, the supranatural destination of human being. I know it's, 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 it's totally uh, 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 counterintuitive. Uh, so, I will say that the fact that humans metaphysical goal is achieved only in a negative way by the destro destruction of this earthly condition of, of living shall be corrected. But I think that to try to compensate or to explain this, this thing by culturalist narrative, I think it's just the, the new opiums of the intellectuals. Okay, I thank you for your uh, attention. Um, thank you very um, much. Thank you. We have a few minutes for for discussion. Yes, so it will be so provocative. Go ahead, Yumi. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, this is really wonderful and uh, also informative and helpful talk. I I wish I I knew, uh, this this content before I'm published. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is um, 
because because、uh, you have really broad picture about how history of philosophy goes, and、uh, which I don't have.、Um, so I have very simple minded question from as a historian of philosophy. <laughs> so a lot of people, which I necessarily agree with, think that、uh, as you already said that. Western mindset is the cause of environmental problems. So we have to change this mindset. We, if we don't change this way, this already kind of a conventional way of thinking,、um, we cannot solve this problem. And、um, some people think that it can be attributed to, for example, Aristotle,、uh, who thinks that、uh, there is a hierarchy. In the natural world, and human beings are the top of it, and、uh, human beings are、um, all other、um, living beings are kind of the、um, um, uh, source to provide、uh, for human to achieve a kind of epistem epistem epistemic excellence. So, humans they have the teleological view. That、uh, humans are kind of the perfect, completed version of other non human beings. And this kind of mindset has to be changed because otherwise、um, we, we keep exploiting the natural、uh, beings, for example. I'm not sure whether it's true, to be honest, to you. <laughs> And、um, yet, I, I'm thinking. And, and so, so, what do you respond to those people who committed to the idea that, well, there is a traditional way of thinking. And if we don't break this tradition, we can not change the, how the society and the economic works. And just,、uh, Probably you already said, but probably I missed it. But、uh, I just want to know what you would say more about this kind of、uh, attitude. Yeah. Okay.、Uh, thank you very much for, for your, for your uh, uh, question, uh, Professor uh, Suzuki.、Um, so, yeah,、um, I mean, what you say、uh, is, is totally what you said in, the, in this paper by Washington and all in.、Uh, Uh, the conservation journal, and actually, it's a, it's a paper that uh, that uh, I've read because I was commenting on that. And、uh, in my comments, I say I, I totally disagree with every point of they said, but it is so caricatural that you should publish it because otherwise I would have no way to 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 quote it, you know. And to so say, yeah, publish it. It is so untrue at so many levels that you should you should really publish it. It's a masterpiece. Uh, in uh. uh Okay, so in its own sake. So、uh, it was published, fortunately, and so now I can cut it.、Uh, and, and so、um, what you say is many, many things I've been saying、uh, Plato, Aristotle, and I mean, also, and one of the, you know, one of the biggest things is Christianity, Christianism, you know,、yeah. and because, and here you have some, some you know, some,、uh, because Uh, in the monotheist tradition, you have the opposition between God and human beings, and, and the, the, the,、uh, God is, is given a nature for, for human beings, etc. But for me, I mean, we have to think histor historically, historically, sorry, historically. And the fact is that if, for example, I just take the, the, this notion of this indictment of、uh, Christianity as one of the major cultural causes. For our contemporary ecological scenes, which is in itself a very Christian way to, to frame the problem. Yeah, yeah.、Uh, so when you say that, you, you seem to forget that the medieval economy was actually extremely, extremely, I would say, conservative. I mean, the notion of humility, of frugality, they are core Christian values. And in the medieval economy, there was no notion of growth, actually. I mean, if you look at what medieval historians say, they say it's mainly it is an economy of subsistence. And there was no notion of development, of progress, of, of I mean, of course, you have kind of 
I mean, overconception by the elite, you know, I mean, the, the aristocrat and the king, I mean, eat, eating, you know, uh, 12, uh, 12 kind of, of different uh, um, meats in, in one, okay, meal, but, you know, this is just something, but otherwise, it seems to me that it is almost the contrary. It seems that, I mean, historically speaking, it is the securization of the society goes with the rise of environmental issues. So historically speaking, you, you don't really have a, 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 a basis to claim that it is because a society dominated by, by, I mean, Christianity, for example, I mean, uh, was not uh, conductive to such ecological destruction that actually came more with the secularization of society. Mm -hmm. So historically speaking, I don't think there is a really clear connection between these two things. I would say even on the contrary, the mm -hmm. secularization of society and the fact that now we know that, you know, there is no uh, uh, there is no life after life. And just we should, you know, we should just enjoy this life now and there is nothing you know, there is no paradise, no inferno. Uh, we don't care about that. We just should enjoy. Uh, and yes, uh, we should enjoy and just consume and just, you know, extract and just enjoy. So I will say the, more or less, maybe it's, it is the contrary. So for a little talk, I mean, you can always go back to some concept and things, but I mean, this is, I think this is almost the contrary. I mean, also the opposite. So it's not because Levi says that nature is great and you want to say nature is important <laughs> that you don't have that you don't have rice culture, deforestation, and all these things. So I think we really should disconnect civilizational process and cultural. Uh, I will say sayings. You can have a culture which is you know rich in terms of environmental awareness and the civilization which is in itself because it, it needs to progress, it needs to develop may be conductive to, you know, harmful uh, environmental uh, 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 productive um, issues. So in terms of, of, of Aristotle, I think, I mean, because I mean, I, I, at least you could, maybe you could say that about Plato, but because Aristotle or because of his understanding of, of the connection between, I would say, uh, the notion of essence and, and reality, I, I don't see. I don't see how we can make the plan. The claim and and Aristotle himself, he was a naturalist. He was describing. Uh, he was, you know, introducing a lot of, of classification, and uh, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm really. Uh, I think we, we should be more historical and, and look at when things are happening and start to explain things when they are happening and just not to you know go retrospect and go back you know to to. To, to Christianity, to rise to tone and what, what, whatsoever. I mean, I mean, the contemporary definition of the Anthropocene by geologists say that Anthropocene starts in the middle of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So this is a, this is the time frame that, that we have. Mm -hmm. And for the geologists and the uh, scientific communi community, Anthropocene is something we start with globalization. So it is interesting this middle 20th century inception of the Anthropocene for scientists, and of course here you have a difference between human, I mean, say human humanity scholars and scientists, because human uh, scholars they will have a tendency to prefer to say that Anthropocene starts, we you know, with the Industrial Revolution or with the uh, colonization, for example, you know, but so here you have different kind of of, of framework, but I mean. Yeah, I could develop, but uh, I think I already spoke mm -hmm. too much. Thank you very much for your uh, question. And, uh, no, no, uh, and and actually, yeah, um, yeah. It's very clear. Thank you so much. I get up. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you to um, speak a little bit more about um, what you brought up on the last so slide. Um, yeah. This idea of self orientalization um, that oh. uh, you covered fairly quickly. And um, yeah, so I just wanted to hear a little more about that. About this one? Well, I mean, the last slide was, what, the last slide was you know. Uh, uh, maybe the maybe, second maybe, to last. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, because yeah. the last slide, I mean, this is very extremely metaphysical. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, the one prior. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Here, it, here it is very provocative. I mean, you know, the idea is that, you know, the earth destruction justifies from what ca count call, you know, the, 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 
post natural condition of human being. I mean, I mean, if Kant is true when he says that you know human beings we don't uh, we have kind of rational destination which is overcoming nature, maybe this is the result of that. So maybe okay, but uh, this is something which is a kind of very complex uh, issue. So yeah, the notion of self orientalization. Okay, here yeah, this is uh, mainly uh, a Rive Dearly concept. Okay, self orientalization. Um, so Arif Dearly he wrote many, I mean, many books and uh, about this uh, about this concept. Okay, what self orientalization means is that um, to say it simply, the Asian author is using. Uh, characterization coming from Western Westerners, which were defining defined in negative terms and turning them in positive terms to describe themselves. Okay, let me explain. For example, Orientalist, uh, Eurocentric Orientalist uh, thinkers like Hegel. Okay, so they will say that you know uh, only the West as logic and uh, only the West as self the capacity to self governance. And the Asian, they don't have, and so and they are emotional, irrational, etc. Okay, and then self orientalism would be okay. Yes, I mean we 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 are not rational, but that's good because rational nas rationality is bad. So so yeah yeah yeah. I mean all the bad all the things that you say about us in negative terms, I turn them in negative terms. So I don't change the thing that you say about them. I'm not really. Overcoming, I'm not uh, really, I will say, uh, criticizing all this culturalist, culturalist correct characterization. I'm not uh, criticizing your culturalist discourse narrative. I am just giving to it all the values, negative from negative value to positive values, and I am reinforcing these things. Yes, I mean, yes, you're right. Uh, yes, you you are right. Uh, my culture is peculiar. Yes, you're right. Uh, my culture is more connected to nature than to logos. Yes, you're right, uh, etc. So, so this is uh, what is called uh, self-orientalization, and it goes also with the process of culturalist essentialism. That means that in this process of self-orientalization, you will reinforce your own so-called Asian characteristic to uh, to I would say to look more Asian to yourself. And so you will start to, you know, um, disconnect yourself or distance yourself from some features that maybe what were, you know, on the margin as a frontier between you and me. Okay. So here is a very simple kind of contradistinction. In order to to define myself, I will define myself in opposition to you, and thus all the features that maybe we will have in common. I will try to erase these features. I will try to cancel these features. And I will just, in order to, to, to make this separation clearer. OK, so um, I think basically uh, this is what uh, uh, Dierlich, uh, at least my understanding, uh, maybe a kind of difference uh, from Dierlich's notion of self-orientalization. I mean, turning orientalism as something which is actually positive because you give yourself to these new values. I don't know if I explain or not. Yeah, it's very helpful. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, I think we should move on because we yeah, only yeah, have yeah, an hour left. Um, I have a question, but I'm just going to wait until the end if in case there is extra time um, for Q&A. Okay, so I guess I'm up. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks uh, for having me here. It's really lovely to be part of this conversation. And I want to thank um, Paul D'Ambrosio for organizing and also my fellow uh, panelists for their really provocative and thoughtful talks. And uh, thank you, Sarah, for uh, facilitating the conversation. Um, I'm going to talk a bit informally um, about um, some aspects of early Confucian thought that I think are relevant to thinking through um, issues related to contemporary environmental ethics. Um, and the way I think about environmental ethics is 
as being concerned with uh, the relationship between humans and the broader world and with one another. So I'm conceptualizing this in a pretty, like, how can we live well in the world and in relation to one another? Um, and I mean, I think the insights um, from the first two talks were really helpful to me. So I'm appreciative of those. And maybe in the discussion, we can talk um, a little bit more uh, about the interconnections among our perspectives. I mean, I think uh, in the first talk, um, the, the um, foregrounding of the kind of more social um, and institutional orientation of Confucianism uh, in compared to Taoism, uh, in comparison to Taoism was really helpful. Um, and I think in the second talk, um, lots of really provocative food for thought um, regarding the way in which um, traditions come into dialogue with one another and are uh, framed uh, internally and externally. Um, so I do want to say a couple words to just um, situate my thinking um, in relation to uh, Professor Hurtabise's uh, uh, talk. Um, so I come at these issues from both environmental philosophy and also from a sort of comparative philosophical perspective. And I think one of the things that's been helpful to me uh, in thinking about comparative philosophy are sort of um, ideas from Thomas Kasulis, who talks about, um, he has a book called Intimacy or Integrity, um, where he talks about how there's overlap um, and commonality among diverse traditions, but one of the things that makes traditions somewhat distinct from one another is the way they tend to foreground or background different things. So like, you know, in the United States, we tend to foreground ideas of like freedom and autonomy. Um, it's not that other cultures or other traditions don't have those concepts or some version or some aspect of those concepts, but they might not be foregrounded or um, in the same way that they are in say American culture, dominant American culture. Um, but obviously American culture also has, you know, concepts of community um, and connectedness. So it's not that we have to go, you know, across the world um, to, to find those ideas necessarily. Um, nevertheless, I think like it can be instructive uh, to see how different traditions um, uh, mobilize different conceptual resources and understand them. And so my talk is really going to sort of try and draw out a few ways in which early Confucianism, I think, offers some resources um, for thinking about environmental effects in this very broad sense of uh, living well in the world and in relation to one another. Um, and I think I'm not really going to focus on ways in which early Confucianism explicitly addresses the environment or nature or plants or animals. I mean, there are aspects, um, as um, Dr. Suzuki brought out, there are, um, there's definitely discussion of those things, but I think some of the resources about how, about um, related to social values and um, how we think about uh, relations with one another and the broader world, I think, are what I really want to focus on. Um, so um, yeah, so I'll start, and this is going to be slightly autobiographical, I guess, too, because um, I was thinking about sort of what I found resonant in these texts when I first encountered them. Um, and so I'll start with the Analects. Um, and I think like this might be surprising, but I think one of the interesting things about that I find really interesting about uh, the Analects of Confucius or Kongzi is um, the sort of grappling with issues of social change. Um, and I think that may be surprising because uh, Confucius is often known as somebody who's very conservative, traditionalist, doesn't like change. Um, but in some ways, I think this text can be read as, you know, all about social change um, in that uh, Kongsa is very unhappy with 
Um, and I think early Confucians generally are very unhappy with the state of the world, the degree of conflict and fractiousness um, that characterized their time and sought to uh, return some kind of greater harmony um, in which uh, collective flourishing was possible. Um, and so one of the one of the things I think that was very interesting to me um, that I think is relevant to, you know, contemporary environmental thinking is this question of um, whether one engages or withdraws from corrupt societies. Um, you know, there's been a sort of uh, I don't know if you think about like the back to the land movement um, in the 60s and 70s or something, you know, so there's this uh, idea of like, well, we can, civilization is corrupt and we can sort of save ourselves um, by withdrawing from civilization. And I've actually found the analects really interesting in sort of thinking about that question, because ultimately I think Confucius comes down and saying that, that that's not really a solution, um, that human, that, you know, the virtue of humanity or humaneness is fundamentally a relational virtue. Um, and that we have to sort of, as to, to be anachronistic and draw on uh, Donna Haraway, we have to kind of stay with the trouble, like um, sort of stick, you know, muddle through with one another in these complex situations where there is perhaps no purity to be to be had. Um, so that's one place where I actually have found the intellects interestingly helpful um, in thinking through um, some contemporary issues. Um, another another place is um, in thinking about how uh, the more relational conception of the self in early Confucianism um, might um, provide insights into uh, discussions and debates about uh, collective action problems. Um, so uh, global climate change is often framed as kind of a giant collective action problem where each individual or each agent, you know, you can move, do this at multiple levels. You can think about individuals and their incentives. You can think about nation states and their incentives. Um, the idea is that each individual has sort of um, an incentive to you know, continue to emit fossil fuels or continue to consume um, while wanting others to curtail or curb their consumption. Um, but um, the, the sort of collective rationality would say that we should all kind of, you know, all curb our consumption of fossil fuels. Um, but at the individual level, there's this uh, incentive that seems to be in in uh, conflict with that because the kind of costs of my, say, my individual consumption are externalized, you know, uh, to the to the whole. Um, and this also um, has led people to suggest that individual action has really no impact um, uh, on, on collective action problems um, because uh, individual efforts to say uh, curtail consumption or you know an individual nation, even an individual nation's efforts to cut uh, greenhouse gases uh, won't have any impact in the absence of you know everyone agreeing to do something. Um, and I, I and so this is, I think, led to this view that um, that system change is sort of the only route forward and that system change is entirely independent of actions of individual agents. And this is where I actually think that um, some early Confucian resources are helpful um, because I think sometimes this way of framing the conversation so strongly dichotomizes um, the difference between acting individually and acting collectively. And I think uh, in early Confucianism, there's a conception of the self as embedded in community and in relation, um, where what one does as an individual um, has like uh, echoes outward. Um, you know, Confucius famously said, you know, virtue is never solitary. It always has neighbors, learning and the way in which um, we can um, 
uh, draw from, uh, draw insights from others for our own action. And so I think this sort of more relational conception of the self suggests that um, an individual institution, an individual person, an individual nation state um, in acting um, isn't really acting alone, uh, that uh, those actions are always connected um, in various ways to the thinking and the actions of others. Um, so there's communicative value um, to uh, actions that can and um, and and also moral value in the way we um, sort of choose to act uh, in a collective. Um, so there's more to be said about that, but um, that's something brief. Um, and then lastly, um, I've been thinking about um, some of the ways in which early Confucianism might have. Uh, insights to offer in relation to intergenerational ethics. Um, again, I think we can use climate change as an example, but climate change is clearly an intergenerational challenge, um, but many dominant contemporary institutions are highly oriented toward the short term. Um, so, you know, political systems, economic systems uh, oriented toward, you know, short term uh, returns or short-term election outcomes and so on. Um, and I think um, there are, um, I think people actually do care about future generations, but we don't have, um, uh, our institutions don't foreground um, or provide sort of scaffolding for that care. Um, and I think in early Confucianism, there is a really interesting perspective on intergenerational relations that sort of begins in the family, um, thinking about, um, you know, the family as a sort of central place where we learn uh, empathy, where we learn gratitude, where we learn to reciprocate. Um, and um, where we sort of and where, and also where learning is intergenerational, where children learn from their parents, but I think also um, there's the idea that uh, learning can happen multi-directionally. So Kongza, I think, does learn from or acknowledges the possibility of learning from uh, his students. Um, so there's that sort of micro level sense of intergenerational relations, intergenerational care. There's also, you know, reverence for ancestors and for sort of knowledge that comes from across generations. Um, so uh, Dr. Suzuki mentioned like Yao Shun and Yu. I mean, Confucius is always sort of hearkening back to um, uh, those rulers who were successful um, in, in sort of bringing together, um, uh, sort of creating social harmony and, and supporting uh, common people. Um, so I think um, there's that both sort of within the family, also sort of cross-generational uh, societal level emphasis on intergenerational relations. Um, and I think one of the, if we're thinking, you know, maybe thinking back to social change, like what's the fundamental goal of early Confucianism? I think it is a kind of intergenerational project that seeks mutual flourishing. Um, and so I, I guess I think there are some resources in the tradition um, that might be helpful in thinking through how it might be possible to develop um, theories and perspectives on intergenerational relations and intergenerational ethics that can um, move, help move us past some of the short term and short termism that is so dominant today. Um, so I think there are also, you know, really interesting. So um, Professor Suzuki mentioned uh, harmony, um, and I think there's a really interesting conception of harmony in early Confucianism that is that involves like not harmony through sameness, but a kind of harmony that involves uh, allows for the recognition of difference and complementarity. Um, I think that also is um, has has a lot of uh, salience for contemporary thinking about 
uh, relations among people and with the broader world. But I think I just wanted to offer a sort of a few things, um, ideas for thought. Um, I know I haven't had an opportunity to go into great depth about each of those, but hopefully that'll um, maybe provoke some additional questions and conversation. So thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's see, we have a little bit more than 15 minutes. We can go over for a little bit, but um, I will have to leave at past five. Um, so if we the conversation continues, maybe Paul can take over. So I'm thinking maybe we can like um, leave like eight, 10 minutes for um, this for discussion on this specific talk, and then we can open it for Q&A for everyone for a few minutes. And I'm also happy if people just want to open it up, that's fine with me. If so what whatever's best. Should we let's open it up then and let's have a discussion for the three for the three talks. Did you have a question you need? <clears throat> I think one, what's just the one comment that, uh, to this uh, Mar Marian's talk. And I, I, I found a lot of things which I didn't notice before um, from her talk. Um, it's interesting that the, uh, she, she sees finding activist spirit in Confucianism <laughs> and, uh, and stay with the problems, <laughs> not escape from that. I think it's, it's really and uh, th there is such a spirit and uh, i i i found it a really interesting point to make um um that is true and um um, um even they had uh, from uh, not probably of confucius too but from uh, mencius especially they had the opportunity to talk to lura and they tried to kind of change their mind um um without mm -hmm. offending them <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, Manchester well, is a great example of that. Yes, mm -hmm. and, and the, the rhetoric they use, the kind of political rhetoric they use to try to kind of like change the uh, the, the governmental policy and so on. It's, it's actually, I, I I completely agree, it's amazing uh, to find it. It's, it's pretty, pretty actually unique in early Chinese thought, I think. And uh, also the uh, generational things, so, um, um, I didn't notice before, but uh, yes, it's really true that um, um, Confucius, Confucius are thinking really next generation himself, mm -hmm. and uh, probably it not, cannot be achieved about when in his age, but the next yes. generation might achieve something, and so on and so on. And that kind of, I think, attitude, I, I never noticed it. I, I think it's uh, so interesting that um, um, from her talk, I, I, it uh, they really made me notice about the um uh these things. So yes, uh, thank you so much. It's just a comment and <laughs> thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, those point uh newly made by her. Yeah, thank you very so, much. Yeah. So if I may thank you for, for, for the talk or just thinking about something. I mean uh thinking about uh Professor Suzuki and Professor Odekan uh papers and the one more in a kind of Darius direction. And the other one more in kind of Confucianist direct direction and uh Uruja direction. And so I was uh, also thinking about what, what you say in terms of uh I mean we know that uh, in terms of history of the the the, the, the development of uh Chinese uh, text and Chinese culture from, from China to the East, we know that for example, the, the American countercultural movement, countercultural movement. Uh, it was uh, linked also about very specific things, the fact that um, Daoist texts uh, were translated into German and uh, with the aging at the end of the 19th century, and it was read by Jung, and Jung went to the US, and uh, Jung was very popular, and uh, Jung introduced all these things, and it was very nourishing. The whole uh, countercultural beat generation, I mean, you can read, I mean, you can read Kerouac, and just, you know, as Dharma Burns, okay, um, beautiful, fascinating book. And you, you see all this uh, 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 oriental, um, even orientalistic, I would say, exoticist, I would say, uh, 
pyramid in this um, can counter culture. And I was also thinking about so so is this also manifestation just, just you know about the, the translation process because Taoism was translated much later than Confucianism. Confucianism was mainly uh, uh, 17 and 18th century things, and then Taoism started to to prevail in the 19th century and 20th century with the Jung and Heidegger uh, having some reading of it. So I was also thinking about you know this, this opposition between you know this Taoist direction and this Taoist direction, you know this classical, you know most uh, image of, of the sage, which is you know going back to the mountain and retreating and with the uh, Libra, you know you know drinking wine to the order of nature and to the moon and doesn't care about the society, just you know just below and uh, enjoying the, the, the loneliness. Um, and on the other end, as you say, this ratio, we, we, the fact that we are, how we say, relational animals, okay, that uh, that we are, so we have this re relationality. But I was, was thinking then about something else. I was thinking about maybe to some extent we should overcome both. I mean, because uh, this Taoism uh, is finding nature is loneliness. But uh, on the other hand, Confucianism is thinking about re relationality, but only mainly at the social level, mainly in terms of relation between human beings. And today, the real thing that we have to do is not yeah. to, to go back to nature alone or neither to just simply, you know, rethink the social interaction, but to think new way, to, to, to make relationality a thing which concerns both human and non-humans. Yeah. And so this, in this sense, uh, there is also something which is not sufficient in, in, I mean, you cannot say. I mean, you cannot say that in Alex you have a lot of environmental things. I mean, I don't say I mean, it, it, it was not his point. I mean, you, so so you have these two tendency. You know, loneliness in nature or, or pure human social relation relationality, and I think we should overcome both. What we should have is kind of new relationality, which which with what is not human. And, yeah. and in this sense, I mean, this is something which is neither in, in purely in the Taoist tradition nor in the Confucian tradition. My right. my, my my take. Yeah, yeah. No, I I mean, I I agree. I mean, I think, and I think, uh, you know, Taoism and Confucianism. I mean, they often are set in opposition to one another, but I think there's also some really interesting complementarity. And I mean, I think, like in the Zhuangzi, um. I mean, I think both, well, both traditions have a concept of Uwe or, you know, translated in different ways as non-action or effortless action or non-coercive action, or um, I sort of, I kind of like to think of this as a kind of receptive engagement with the world or attunement um, to the world. Um, and I think um, there's a lot of, res there are a lot of resources in Zhuangzi um, for thinking about how to attend to the non-human um, and in in ways that, I mean, it just, and they're just even the text of the Zhuangzi, like you actually have more, I mean, there are more kinds of creatures, you know, in some ways that are very much like present there. Um, it, and, and whereas in, you know, the early Confucian text, I mean, yeah, there's discussion of I mean, Mencius uses like water analogies. So there's discussion of rivers and sort of uh, agriculture, as um, Dr. Suzuki has brought out. Um, but um, I think the the Zhuangzi in particular, like sort of, it does sort of seem to situate people in relation to many other forms of life in a way that might be really important to kind of complement the much more sort of human socially focused uh, aspects of Confucianism. So yeah, thank you for that really helpful comment. Because you know, many anthropologists that we say now, there's a very idea of separation between human and nature is at the source of the problem. And um, and so uh, yeah, in this way, the, the, the idea of, of a relationality of, of a, of a society which which uh, is including itself natural element, and, and thus a social, I will say, a sociability, which is not only concerning humans. I think this is this is what we 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 are, we are looking for. I mean, sociability, but not understood not understood only in human terms. And uh, I cannot find this 
really, in, in, I mean, I don't know. I mean, the, the, the classical Confucian tradition, this notion of sociability with you know, the non humans, and at the same time, if it is a relation to, to humans, yes, there is kind of, uh, of, of, even even the kind of uh, and the contrary, if you look at the Taoist text, this kind of harmony is actually pre-social. So it's more kind of pre-social that really establishing new modes of sociability. I mean, I mean, my I don't know, my my I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. I don't just yeah. Um, I don't know. I have... and, and also both. Ah, uh, yeah. Sorry, please. Go ahead, go ahead. No, no, no. Uh, just, just, uh, just about uh, Professor Suzuki talking about just thinking about the comparison between Greek and and, and and Chinese thinking. I don't know, but for me, to some extent, I mean, Roman has so much. So, I mean, maybe I have more in common with. I mean, Roman Empire. You have Roman Empire, and you have you know Chinese Empire. You have uh, uh, the, the same kind of administrative structures, the same kind of extension of the empire. With you know uh, ag agricultural uh, people going as a margin, and then they encounter foreign tribes, and then we go to pacify and, and pacifying the the, the the margin. We are extending the empire and the and the and the position of the emperor as a kind of god and his connection to 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 the connection to to you know sun and so Augustus and so it's true that the, the comparison with the Greek Greek civilization I always I always think that I mean if we want to compare I mean. I don't. I mean, um, I, I mean, the, 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 the Roman culture has, has so much uh, in common. I mean, if, if you look at Pline, Pline's old. I mean, is he, I mean, what is is a naturalistic in the old way? I mean, it's almost. I mean, kind of fantasist. You know, it's kind of imaginary uh, uh, naturalism. Um, so I was uh, thinking about uh, me. The, the, the opposition, I mean, the distinction that you made between Greek culture and Chinese culture at, at this moment, at this, I'm not sure if you should just, you know, extrapolate to, to an opposition between Asia and, and the West, because it seems to me that Roman culture, on the contrary, has many administrative, uh, legal, uh, uh, religious, uh, uh, and uh, uh, connection uh, with... Um, with uh, the, 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 the uh, Chinese culture uh, here. Yeah. So I, th I think, so So you talked about Christianity, and uh, I think it's interesting to think about Greek paganism, for example. So there's a lot of different gods, and it's uh, uh, kind of like a, um, belong to the, for example, Poseidon belong to the ocean and the Zeus in the sky. And there is a kind of like, I think, Roman period, there was the interpretation of reading a pagan uh, god as a natural phenomena, for example. And uh, that is uh, probably we can we can think, we can, it, it actually uh, remind us of animism in East Asian countries, for example. Um, so, so I think uh, there is some, uh, a uh, sort of interesting uh, uh, comparison uh, can be done uh, in these areas, um, and and also um, uh, what I was going to say. This happened yesterday. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> there's a lot of ideas coming up because because of your talk, and then uh, sometimes I forget about it. Um, so it's so interesting thing. Uh, the reason why I'm doing the uh, ancient Greek and Chinese comparative study is that they didn't have a historical uh, cultural context yet. So not yet. The Buddhists haven't yet arrived in China uh, before first century AD, and uh, Christianity, which uh, called um. um uh, I'm I'm sorry now I've forgotten the name of the sect, but uh, it came uh, uh, from the uh, uh, from I think uh, northern area and Tibet or uh, uh, northern area uh, did arrive in around the seventh century, but this uh, Christian uh, sect didn't have much influence from ancient Greek philosophy and so on. so and also that the Indian philosophy hasn't uh, probably not very much influential in the Greek society either. And so there is a kind of like a, 
a lot of um, ideas going on. Uh, probably um, 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 uh, because of the transmission of uh, the in the in the Silk Road, probably rather than thought, technology came first. So a lot of art artisans and craftsmen was imported and exported in the during the Silk um, um, uh, through the Silk Road, and they brought a lot of uh, art, for example or a musical instrument, uh, rather than philosophical thought uh, between China and the uh, Western world. Um, so, so, so the reason why I'm doing it, uh, very old, is, old, old age is, you know, I want to kind of like specify what they are unique in these kind of these civilizations. And it's, it's, uh, I think it's, uh, you are right when we talk about something like modern contemporary and, uh, Philosophical issues. I think it's probably you are right, wrong to think that uh, it's all came from um, originate with uh, um, our old way of thinking. But on the other hand, it's also I think it's also difficult uh, in especially in European countries and uh, American uh, Americans uh, to to remove get rid of Christianity uh, from their fundamental way of thinking. That is, I can I, I can say this kind of a thing. Even a lot of people might be uh, atheist. I can say this because I'm a Japanese, <laughs> and <laughs> because we 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 have uh, like three kind of religion uh, came to the uh, this country, and uh, we are kind of like mangling about this. So so I think uh, um so that reason I think uh, um question might be that the, to what extent we are really got the influence from our traditional way of thinking. And um, 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 we can kind of reflect by doing this kind of history study, I guess. So I, I could make some comment, but Sarah, you have a question, it seemed to me. Um, yes, but it has for the most part been addressed. Um, I can like, formulate it and see if there is any extra um, thoughts. Um, I have heard it uh, multiple times that the argument that in ancient, both in ancient Greece and in ancient China, there was no opposition between nature and culture. And in relation to your talks, I was wondering <laughs> if you have any insight as to whether this, first, whether this is accurate and whether this is a useful um, argument to pose in relation to environmental environmentalism. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, 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 so thank you for, for the, for the question. So, um, yeah, before, I, uh, before I'm trying to address the, the, this question, um, one thing that I would like to also to, uh, to say that uh, Professor Suzuki uh, earlier comment is that um, sometimes you can have, uh, you know, in evolution, in terms of biology, some, for example, the eye, it has been invented many times at different moments of the evolution. And so we call that, you know, parallel evolution. What I want to say by this analogy is that you don't need to have contact to have similarities. You don't need to have inference to have similarities. When I speak about similarities, it's not because I was thinking necessarily of, of inferences. I mean, we have, you know, we, we should not be totally, I will say, uh, framed by the notion of diffusion. Of course, diffusion, the concept of diffusion is a way to understand, you know, commonalities between culture. But you, you may have structural commonalities that does not necessitate direct inference or, or I will say, you know, contact, I mean, material uh, contact. For example, the fact that the Han Empire and the Roman Empire emerged almost at the same time and dis disappear almost at the same time, not exactly at the same time, you have 200 centuries of, you know, of difference, but uh, you have some structural similarities between the two empires that does not necessitate the fact of having actual contact to have some thinking similarities. But I think we should uh, don't be so much, uh, I would say we should not 
uh, reduce uh, um, intellectual similarities to the simple fact of, of historical diffusion and also think in terms of structural uh, uh, um, structural uh, analogies um and, and the fact that okay you 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 can have the the eyes that has been invented both by the fish uh, and and the fly and the human uh, for different reasons at different moments and uh but serving the same purpose okay so um so so uh, this is why i, I, I was uh, when you when i was talking about the roman and and, and china yes you have the sea world and then you have you have, you have the translation of things and techniques and and, and etc and, um, and and yes, during the Greek area, uh, first Greek classical time, there was no, you know, Alexander the Greek was not uh, been to to India. He was not yet. Uh, but after that, in any six times, Alexander the Greek going over to India, introducing Greek culture, and then Buddhism start to adopt the standards of Greek culture, and then Greek culture start to be associated with. In terms of, of scriptural form of Buddhism, and when Buddhism enters in China, actually it is also part of the Hellenistic, Hellenistic tradition that goes to China. So it's the sculpture of Buddhism with Buddhism introduced in China. What is also introduced is actually one big part of the Greek culture, okay? Because the, the plastic the plastic form of the Buddha. Before the we know that it was created in the Gandhara culture because of the contact between Hellenistic. Uh, 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 um, representation and before this contact there was no anthropomorphic uh, representation of Buddha it only starts with the Gandhara people Gandhara uh, civilization and the first Buddha you know they have moustache because it was in Pakistan and Afghanistan um, so 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 um, yeah so so yeah, so, so that two, 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 two different, uh, two different things, and then after that, we 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 can say there was a contact, yes, and then the Nestorian they go, they go, they go to China, the Tang, Tang Dynasty, etc. Yeah, um, so so um, you know, uh, for some anthropologists, just to try to to understand to address the first question, to some anthropologists, for example, for uh, Philippe Descola, a French anthropologist. He divided uh, the the um, he divided human thinking in a mindset in four categories, and one of these categories is the notion of analogy. And actually, for Descola, the notion of analogy is common to both Chinese and Greek Roman uh, civilization. So, um, and uh, for Descola, the separation between nature and culture is something that only emerged later on. Uh, with the naturalist uh, ways of seeing the world. I don't know if you have read uh, Descola, Beyond uh, Nature and Culture. It has been translated into English. It's a big book of 500 pages. It is an, is an, an ethnographer. And it was recently in Taiwan uh, for some conference. And uh, French French et et ethnographer, one of the best after Levi Strauss. And so if you look, if you adopt his notion of analogy, uh, he says that both in Greek culture, in Roman culture, and in Chinese culture, you have reasoning by analogy. And so, and this reasoning of analogy is not is not the principal fact. It's not separation between culture and nature. It's not. It's, it's just you have, you can have analogy between different kind of orders. So I will say you, you, it's more it's more a kind of vertical structure. You have analogy vertically. And not in terms of what belongs to nature and what belongs to culture. So here yeah, I can uh, develop a little more, but I think we've already run out of time. But uh, maybe uh, that can be a kind of answer to you know this claim. Uh, I think the best way to understand this claim that you don't have this separation is to go back to Descola. Okay. Okay. Uh, really, I, I really, I really, I mean, if you can read. Philip Descola, Bio Nature and Culture, is one of the most best philosophical, not only anthropological, but philosophical book of the last, you know, 20 years. I mean, yeah, for me. Okay. Right. okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, I have to leave. So I don't know whether Paul wants to take over if there are any more um questions. Yeah, I think um thanks so thanks so much, Sarah. I think we're we're pretty much out of time, but Miriam, you didn't get to say a lot sometimes. So if you have any um remarks or anything okay yeah so thanks no, again. i'm happy yeah thank you
Okay. Yeah. Thanks again, everyone. I think this was, um, you know, a lot of times you read environmentalism papers or you hear talks and sorry, but they're kind of similar. But this one, I think uh, we actually had some fairly different perspectives, not just from one another, but from uh, what a lot of times you read or you hear. So thank you guys very much. Um, and as I said, we'll post the uh, video on YouTube and have a summary come out in about a year's time or so. So good night from- Thank you guys. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you. Well, well, well.